you, Lord. Praise and glory to your name, Lord. We thank you for this day. Thank you for this place. We thank you for the opportunity to be together, to grow in righteousness, to be strengthened. We thank you, Lord, for the doors that will open when we leave this house. And we thank you and praise you for loving us and guiding us in the way everlasting. I prophesy ears to hear and hearts that are open and teachable today. And we give you all the glory and the honor and the praise in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Oh, glory. Hallelujah. This is Pentecost Sunday. Turn it up. Am I on? No. No, I'm not. Now I am. Yes. Hallelujah. Thank you. That's yes. <laughs> on helps. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hmm. Well, the title of today's message is Launched into the Unfamiliar, but not the Unknown. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And I'd like for us to open with Isaiah 43, starting with verse 15. I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. Thus says the Lord who makes a way in the sea and a path through the mighty waters, who brings forth the chariot and horses, the army and the power. They shall lie down together, they shall not rise. They are extinguished, they are quenched like a wick. Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The beasts of the field will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches, because I give waters in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my people, my chosen. This people I have formed for myself. They shall declare my praise. Hallelujah. 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 Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? And there are all these evidences spoken of here of things that, how could you miss a road in the wilderness that was not there before? Or rivers in the desert where there were no rivers in the desert? How could you miss the rivers? How could we? Or that suddenly there's a change in the way things are responding, such as the the ostriches and the jackals responding to God in a different way. These are all things that are not actually familiar to us, but God will make known and his way, his new thing that he is doing. Praise God. Shall you not know it? Let's look at Joshua chapter 3. Joshua chapter 3, and starting with verse 4. Now here Israel is ready to cross the Jordan to enter the promise, into the promised land. And so in verse 4, it says... Yet there shall be space, because here they're being taught, they're being told what to do and how to follow. 
There shall be a space between you and it, that's the ark, when you see the ark begin to move with the Levites. Then it says you between you and it, about 2,000 cubits by measure, do not come near it that you may know the way by which you must go. For you have not passed this way before that you must know the way by which you should go. So they're being given something that is God is revealing himself and causing them to follow him. And they must follow after, they must keep a certain distance, but they must follow. And so they've been given very specific um, things that are required. And it says, because that you may know the way by which you must go, for you have not passed this way before. And the word well there, passed, is an interesting word. And it means av avar, to cross over, to go over, or to go beyond, to get over, to go through, to pass through or pass along, to come over and to pass beyond. It is the, it says to pass from one side to the other side. So we're going from one place to another place, a place they've never been before. And it's an interesting thing there because they're then told in verse five that sanctify, Joshua was to tell the people that they're to sanctify themselves for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. And that word sanctify, it means to the people were asked to divorce themselves from anything that was unclean and to vote themselves holy, completely, whole heart, mind, will, and strength, holy to God, completely and holy, hallelujah. That's every part of their being, eyes upon the Lord, following him, and to divorce themselves from anything that isn't. That can be prayer for us. Lord, if it's not of you, reveal it to me that I might divorce myself from it. It's a powerful prayer. And the Holy Spirit will give us the revelation of those things for which we need to divorce ourselves from. And that would be anything that isn't of him. And when we do, then we are fully and wholly concentrated on our heart, our mind, our life, dedicated, consecrated to the Lord God Almighty. And then he goes on to say, for tomorrow, tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Tomorrow. Tomorrow's an unfamiliar thing, isn't it? Huh. It's unfamiliar to us, but not to God. I don't know exactly what tomorrow holds, nor do any of us, but I know who holds tomorrow, and I know he holds me in his hands. That's the, the concept that we live by in faith. We don't have to know exactly. Um, I don't remember, I didn't know I was gonna bring it out, but it fits in, so I'm going to share it. I was studying this week, and there was a place in scripture that kind of jumped out at me a little bit. It had to do with, <clears throat> you say that you, tomorrow will be exactly the same as today. Tomorrow will be exactly the same as today. You know that there are times in life where you go along and along and along and tomorrow seems like it is exactly the same as today for long periods of time. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Um, I remember as a young girl, I can identify with this with summer vacation. It seemed endless. Every day seemed like the same as the day before it. But there would come that day when, guess what? 
ta-da, summer vacation is over. It's time to go back to school. But there's a time when it seems, and there can be this in the lives of believers where you say, it said, that tomorrow is going to be the same as today. So they're being told tomorrow, their tomorrow is going to bring about a really big change in their life. They're going in. Hallelujah. This is what they have been waiting for since God delivered them out of Egypt. And here it is, and it's going to happen tomorrow. And it says, and the Lord will do wonders amongst you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes, we do know who holds tomorrow. And he is omnipotent. That's all powerful. He's omniscient. He's all knowing. And he's omnipresent. He's everywhere. And that's sufficient for us. We haven't passed this way before, but he knows the way. He is the way. Knowing this causes us to be expectant in him and to trust that he knows, Jeremiah 29, 11, the very thoughts he thinks toward us, the plans, the purposes he has for us, the future he has purposed, and it's good because he's good and we're his. Praise be to God. And he will do wonders. Wonders. That's an interesting. Hallelujah. Tomorrow, be watchful. Be expectant. Watch and see. He will do wonders amongst you tomorrow. And so let's take a look at that meaning. And we'll kind of just talk for a minute. It's kind of getting off track, but not exactly. Um, in Judges 13.9. Pretty powerful story, the story of Samson and his birth. And it's the story his parents um, were barren. They could not have a child. And the angel of the Lord came to them and spoke with them and, that, and gave them instructions and said that they would you know, conceive a son and gave instructions for training this son in righteousness. And so this is from that particular, I'll just pick it up in verse 19, Manoah is Samson's father. Uh, maybe eight, verse 18, the angel of the Lord said to him, why do you ask my name? Because they kept, they asked the angel of the Lord to come back and he did, gave them more instruction. Initially, he just met with um, Samson's mother to tell her then they both, and they had their questions. And God isn't against asking honest heart questions. So he says, why do you ask my name seeing it is wonderful? And he says, Manoah took the young goat with the grain offering and offered it upon the rock to the Lord. And he, that's the Lord, did a wondrous thing while Manoah and his wife looked on. Before I share the meaning of that, I'll just go ahead and share what happened. Verse 20, it happened as the flame went up toward heaven from the altar, the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame of the altar. And when they saw this, they fell on their faces to the ground. And it's an interesting thing. And then they became fearful that they had seen God and that they were going to die, but they talked to themselves, why would God bring us to go through all this and reveal this to us only to destroy us? So they actually stir themselves up in the Lord by convincing themselves that this was something good and it was a plan from God and it was some, not something bad. So in the same light of when Israel is about to cross the Jordan and go in, and the Lord says, and I will perform wonders amongst you, hallelujah, tomorrow. And that meaning is literally to perform a miracle, a marvel, a wonder or a supernatural deed that is something beyond the human ability to grasp, do, 
or achieve. Wonderful. Matters beyond normal human perception, requiring supernatural insight to see them even. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I want us to, that helps below for wonderful, the beyond the natural. I want us to just turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9 through 16. to read 9 through 16. As it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God, for what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. I'm going to say that again, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Praise be to God. The things of the Spirit are spiritually discerned. Hallelujah. And this Hebrew term, which is translated wonderful, in Isaiah 6, 9, 6, refers to the coming Messiah. Too marvelous for words. Too glorious and excellent beyond the natural ability to comprehend. The world can't know because one has to be alive unto God, born from above, born of the Spirit, in order to be able to discern the things of the Spirit. Well, after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection to new life, he continued to appear to and meet with his disciples over the next 40 days. Let's turn to Acts chapter 1, starting with verse 2. I'll start with verse 1. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. Praise Jesus. 
For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And then verse 9. Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Praise be to God. Hallelujah. As you saw him go into heaven. Hallelujah. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount of, called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey. And when they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying. There was Peter and James and John and Andrew and Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James. All these continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Praise Jesus. Hallelujah. So they watched him ascend into heaven. After he commanded them to wait in Jerusalem to tarry and wait for the promise of the Father. Hallelujah. Now remember, there they do not have a full revelation. You cannot have a full revelation of something that you have not experienced. They only know what Jesus has told them and they're going to wait. Now the promise, that's an, an interesting thing in itself. I want us to take a look at that. We're going to kind of take a look at some of this. What the meaning of promise is. And that's found in the word wealth in Acts 13, 32. Is we declare to you glad tidings that promise which was made to the fathers. And the meaning of the word here in Acts 13.32 is both a promise and the thing promised. It's an announcement with the special sense of promise, pledge, and offer. It's a promise from God is and then gives the assurance that the thing promised will be done. You know, we've all in this lifetime probably had many people who have made promises us, to us and have let us down with the promises they made. But God won't. All of God's promises are yes and amen. And he is faithful in all things. And it is for us to look to him and trust him so knowing that they went they returned to jerusalem why well because they believed jesus and were obedient disciples they didn't need to know how long he said to do it 
and that was enough for them. To trust, to obey, and be expectant in what was to come. Expectant is a big part of it. When a promise has been made, there's always an expectancy that goes along with it. How, what exactly is this going to be? We don't know exactly, but there's an unfolding of it, and it's about to happen. And we don't know how long. Praise God. What did they do? They waited. They waited for all of the promise, knowing that God is faithful. And in him, all of his promises are yes and amen. And they stayed in purpose of mind. They didn't waver between two opinions. They didn't complain that it was taking too long. You know, as we think about that concept of taking too long, you know, I, I think of the concept of our society that we live in, and even much within the church itself. You know, it's like we still own our time. We own our time as if we belong to ourselves. Um, that they didn't question is a trait of, an, of a disciple. They had counted the cost of being a disciple, a follower of Jesus, and their days belonged to him. Their life belonged to him. So they had already counted the cost. So they didn't need to ask him how long it would be because it didn't matter how long it would be. They trusted that he had a good plan, the Jeremiah 29, 11. And they didn't have to try to figure out you know, what they were going to do and how long it would take. They just trusted God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hmm. You know, as I said, they didn't complain either that it was taking too long. And doesn't he know I've got important things to do? They didn't argue amongst themselves or get irritated with each other. No, they were in one accord. That is in one common purpose. And you know, when we as believers have the one common purpose, where our eyes are on the Lord, it's amazing how all the, these other things seem to fall away. One common purpose, eyes on the Lord, one place in one accord. Praise Jesus. So I want us to pick up with Acts chapter 2, starting with verse 1, and just share. When the day of Pentecost, Pentecost is seven weeks and a day after Passover. It means 50. So 50 days had fully come. And Jesus had spent 40 days with them on the earth. So that means that if this was the day of Pentecost fully come, they were in the upper room for 10 days. I've thought about that. I've thought about that. You know, um, I don't like being on a vacation for more than a week. Uh, a, a week's vacation, I mean like, you know, uh, eight days is good, but 10 days is too long. 10 days is too long. Um, it just, I, I start to want to get on with life. I don't know if any of you are like that. Maybe not. You might be able to live on an endless vacation and be perfectly, wow, this is great, you know. But for me, um, I actually, many years ago, I tried it, and I found that at the end of a week, I was ready to be home, and I had things to do and places to go. And I just, so the concept of 10 days means that you really would have to have surrendered fully and completely your life to the Lord. Now, they didn't know it would be 10 days. So day after day, I mean, you're just expectant. When God says something, you're just expectant. You're expectant that it's going to happen. And it's going to happen the way he said. And we're not exactly sure what the promise, what the outpouring of the Holy Spirit's going to look like, but we know it's got to be good. Praise God, it's got to be good. Hallelujah. So they were all in one place in one accord. And that means that one place, oh, that's another part of this that is so powerful to me. Because John 17 is so powerful. And John 17, 24 is where Jesus' prayer, where he says that those that you have given me, Father, would be with me. And this is one of those concepts of 
being with him. Now he had gone on to heaven, but he was as much with them as if he was right there in the room wearing his leather sandals. And they were, you know, being able to touch him because he promised he'd never leave them nor forsake them. So he is with them. He'll never leave them. But the whole idea is to be with him where he is. And that's that single purpose, that unity that comes from Jesus being the one on whom our eyes are completely, where we're not trying to figure out what somebody else is doing and the way they're doing it. We're just loving Jesus and letting him fulfill what needs to be done. Thank you, Jesus. So he says, hallelujah, they were all in one place, hallelujah, in one accord. And in John 17, he invites us to come and be one with him as he's one with the Father and Holy Spirit. And we can't, how can two walk together unless they agree? So we have to agree with God and who he is. Those who come to him must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And we must believe and trust him and look to him. Praise Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Remember, it's Hebrews 13, 5. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. He was as with them as if he was standing in the room. Hallelujah. And he's pouring out his spirit upon them, the most holy spirit of almighty God. And because they were in unity, in one place, and their eyes were on him, which is the only thing that would make it possible, it's actually a miracle. You know that the church is a miracle. It's a miracle when people who have different ideas, different giftings, different plans, purposes, and agenda can all come together in one place, in one accord, with their eyes on Jesus, and let him be the Lord of our life. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. Praise be to God. But it's about being a disciple. It's about trusting him and believing him and, and not belonging to ourself. And suddenly, praise be to God, suddenly, oh, don't you just love the suddenlies of God? Hallelujah, hallelujah. Verse two, suddenly there came a sound from heaven. Been listening for the sound recently? Always listening for the sound because God told me, said I'm sending a new sound. That was quite a few years ago. I'm always listening for the sound, hallelujah. And, and that isn't the sound of the trumpet, I don't believe at this time. It's the sound of what God's doing in the midst of what's happening in our world right now. Listen for the sound, the new sound. And it says that like a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. They were all filled with Holy Spirit, began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. You know, our day is no different. We, we are waiting, standing, praying, agreeing with what God has revealed to us for such a time as this. He's doing a new thing, and we haven't passed this way before. He is doing a new thing. We are in a new era, and we are standing and believing God. Second Chronicles 20, 20, believe God, and you will be established. I've said it many times, but it bears repeating. It feels good to be established, doesn't it? You know, some gardens are being planted right about now, and those plants that are going into the ground have to be established. The root system has to be established. When we believe God, we become rooted and established in him. We become like trees planted by the river of life. 
you know, whose leaf will never fade nor wither and everything we touch will prosper. And when the shaking comes and the winds come, because the root system is in him, then that tree will not be blown over, but will stand, hallelujah, and bear fruit and seed that represents the continuation and ongoing plan and purpose of God for such a time as this. Glory to God, hallelujah. Yep, we're standing, believing God, Second Chronicles 2020, being established like trees of righteousness that cannot be shaken. And we're expectant. We're expectant. We're listening. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're not backing down. We're watchful for the many signs in the heavens. And we're in one place with the Lord our God in this for such a time as this, the new era that we've entered into. We know God's word is true. All his promises are yes and amen, and we're waiting for the suddenly. Hallelujah. We're waiting for the suddenly. Jesus preparing to return to the Father and helping his disciples understand. In John 13, 36, let's just go there. John 13, starting with verse 36. Let me see here. I'm in 12. This is where Jesus has been preparing his disciples. You know, his time here in the flesh on the earth is, is coming to an end. The days that may have at times for the disciples even seemed that every day would be the same as the next, going along through a, a lovely journey of being with the Lord and doing the things that they were doing. But that time is coming to an end, and, and he's preparing them for this. And so he says... That he, where do I want to pick it up here? He has given them the new commandment that they would love each other. It says by this, verse 35, all will know you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Then the Lord, Simon Peter says to him, Lord, where are you going? Where are you going? This isn't playing out the way Simon Peter and the disciples had hoped. Where are you going? And Jesus says to them, where I'm going, you cannot follow me now. But you will follow me afterward. And it's an interesting thing, the reason that it was, he couldn't follow them, or they couldn't follow him now, was because he had not yet died on the cross of Calvary born the sin of the whole world, died once for all, bore your and my sin, sickness and every form of dis-ease, every form. And so they couldn't follow him there. And then he would be buried and descend into the lowest hell and ascend into the highest heaven where he is seated at the right hand of the Father and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. But at the right hand of the Father, he is interceding continuously for those who are his. And he does say, you will follow me afterward. That must have been very confusing. But we do follow him. And we will follow him. We followed him in, at our new birth. We were buried with him in baptism. And we were raised to him with new life, into new life, and became a new creation in Christ, old things having passed away in all things, having become new. So I want to bring it down to the place where 
in, in chapter 14. So Simon has said to him, where are you going? And Jesus said, where I'm going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow me afterward. So he goes on and he tells him, tells them that he is going to um, go and prepare a place for them, and then he will come and receive them. And then he says in verse four, chapter 14, 4, and where I go, you know. <laughs> and the way you know. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. And how can we know the way? <clears throat> Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I am the way. You know the way because I am the way. And you follow me. Hallelujah. What does it mean to follow? It means to accompany, to go along with, to go the same way with, to follow one who precedes, as in a union with. It is a road. Praise be to God. Hallelujah. It can easily be transferred to the life of the Christian as we follow Jesus as disciples of the Most High God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yep, it's a new day. God's doing a new thing. It's a new era. Some things are unfamiliar to us. We haven't been this way before, but we do know the way because Jesus is the way and where he leads, we follow. And Holy Spirit is here to guide us into all truth. Hallelujah. Praise be to God. I just pray that this is sealed to us this day, on this Pentecost Sunday, in the new era, the new thing God's doing. All we have to do is say yes to him and trust him and let the unfolding be. Yes, we haven't been this way before. Hallelujah, God is for us. And if God be for us, who can be against us? Hallelujah. And he's with us. He promised to never leave us or forsake us. And he is here to bring us through to the fulfillment of every single thing he has planned and purposed for such a time as this. I just ask special blessing upon this house in this day and this era that we're in. And I just speak healing and life and wholeness and joy unspeakable to each and every one as we go our way rejoicing today, hallelujah, to celebrate this Pentecost Sunday and be reminded that Jesus is the way, hallelujah, and we know the way. If there's anybody here who has a need for prayer for anything, please come forward. Otherwise, let's go our way rejoicing. In Jesus' name, amen.